First up, we have Jasmine Nolt and Rugi Kane, and their work is centered around identity. Something that's super powerful about this work is that students really discover who they are. They didn't realize who they were or are and how everything's interconnected. So Rugi and Jasmine will be sharing how to make AP Seminar African Diaspora content culturally relevant to students, as well as how students are tapping into the identity to explore their passions. So I'll give it up to our two teachers. So I'm Jasmine Nall. Um, I'm coming out of California. When we showed that map earlier and that one little dot in Corona, that was me. That was me in my class. Um, what we're going to focus on is, as you guys know, with teenagers, sometimes it's hard to engage them in general in education. And um, I come from a history base for seminar. So we're gonna focus on how to teach engaging material using African diaspora to really get buy-in from the students. You wanna introduce yourself first? Oh. Um, so like I said, I'm in Corona. I'm at Centennial High School. Um, normally when I say that, I get football questions because that's what our school is known for. We're not known for our academics, but we also do that. We have an IB program, we have an extensive AP program. Um, and we just recently, I was part of the team that helped launch the Umoja community at our school. Um, this is East Coast. Are you guys familiar with Puente? Okay, um, well, Umoja is kind of like for African Americans as Puente is for Latin American students. It's basically designed to create a curriculum um, and a school-based program that helps engage specifically minority students and African American students. So we just launched that this last couple years. And so that's helping, again, also engage with tying an AP seminar, but that's um, a little bit about my school. So in California, we do things a little bit different in education. We try to put as many bodies as possible in small rooms. <laughs> um, we recently just worked out an agreement with the union that we're gonna drop that size down to 40. So we're pretty excited about that. That's a reasonable number for, for us to 40, yes, correct. I have had instances of 62 was my highest. And so, you know, we had kids on the floor and we don't even have that many desks. But it's fine, it works out, everything, it's great. It is what it is. Um, so if you guys have larger classrooms, this, it sounds like you don't, um, this number. Uh, but I'll show you some assignments and some projects that work on larger class sizes and obviously you can tailor them down to your smaller class sizes that you're used to. Centennial is based out of Riverside County, which is a suburb far, far off of LA, if you're familiar at all with um, Southern California. So we have a really ethnically diverse classroom. We have everything from um, Asian American, Pacific American, Caucasian, um, African American, Latino. Um, I would say for seminar, because of how I kind of created it and centered on cultural studies, I was able to get like an exact mix of our demographics. So we kind of got a blend of everything and you'll be able to see that in the engaging process as well. So hello everyone. Um, I'm Rugi Atukan. My students call me Miss Rugi. Um, and Jasmine and I have both been using the African diaspora in our classes, even before learning about the African Diaspora Consortium curriculum that is being designed that you will all be part of. And so Part of what we share is what we've been able to do and create in our classes and hope that that inspires you in the planning of your units or even of your whole entire course. Um, I am a product of the diaspora. My mom is from, is from the US here and my father is from Senegal. So that's why you see those flags on the map. And I also come from an HBCU education background and that has shaped the way that I designed this course. At Spelman, we have a course called ADW, African Diaspora in the World, and I further went on to do sustainability studies. And so I've incorporated my background and my passions into the design of my course, and that's what I want to encourage you to do. Find what you're interested in and use that also in your classes. I teach at the Senegalese American Bilingual School in Dakar. This is one of my classes. We have smaller class sizes. I like to keep my seminar classes around 20 if possible. But my students come from all over. I explained a little bit, we have students who are of Senegalese origin but who were born and grew up in the US, in France, in the UK, in China, in Italy. Students from other parts of Africa, from Madagascar, from 
um, Mali from Benin, and we also have students who are African Americans in our classroom. So it creates a really unique opportunity to look at diasporic topics from such varied lived experiences and perspectives. Um, so that's a little background about my students. And I titled my course several years ago, Sustainable Development and Me, really trying to get students to see themselves and their role in the world. So um, we use the AP framework that you should all be familiar with, the Quest framework. And I used a social ecological um, model to design this class with the African adolescent in mind. So it starts with the first layer, which looks at identity and youth, their power as individuals and as collectives. And it moves on to look at social and economic issues, environmental sustainability, and at a fourth layer, even global policies. So this was the inspiration for how I designed the AP seminar course at SABS. I just showed that I would be sharing about the two units. So sustainability, what is this? It's a fancy word out there that really means that we're looking at the intersections of social, economic, and environmental issues to be able to address the needs of today and of the future, which goes really well into the lenses of seminar. So that's what I use. And to tie it to this idea of social develop, um, sustainable development, me, we look at identity. And students here really start to understand who they are, um, the social, and personal elements of identity. We start with questions about names. Um, in Africa, naming traditions are really important because we believe that names have strong meanings and can even determine destinies. And that's a really eye-opening conversation for students to explore what is the meaning behind their name. And we tie it to another person whose name is quite popular around the world, Malala Yousafzai. So this is one of the examples that we use. We start with her memoir, um, a leader in the space of girls' education, a Nobel Prize winner. And we also talk about um, the story of William Kamkwamba, a young Malawian who built a windmill in his, fam in his village to bring water to irrigation in the time of drought. And I share these two because they're stories that my students can relate to. In Senegal, we have a predominantly Muslim population, so I know that a lot of the Muslim girls would see themselves in the story of Malala. And we're in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of people would be able to relate to the stories of William Kamkwamba. So I use these two individuals to open up that conversation about the power that young people can have. They fight in the space of education, our students are in education, and so this is one of the main topics of the first unit, where students at the end of the unit have to write their first paper, um, or their first longer length paper um, as it relates to education and understanding those different perspectives in the field of education. And I share this, which really goes well in line with um, what Marianne was talking about earlier, this quote about um, until the lion is their own teller of history, tales of the hunting will always glorify the hunter. And I share this with my students for them to understand not only the importance of being able to write well and be good writers, but also being the writers of their stories. And so this is one of my favorite quotes to share with my students, and I'm glad that it came up a little bit earlier. So. This picture, perhaps the stereotypical image of children in Africa. And if I had just asked, what do you th what's the first image that comes up when you think of children in Africa? Somewhere along the line, there would have been a, ch a picture of a child who is perhaps poor or starving, maybe with flies. Typical poverty porn image. And this is unfortunately the story that many of my students are faced with when they go abroad or when they're somewhere else in the world and people think or learn or talk about Africa, it's this narrative that they are faced with. However, Chimamanda Adichie says that the danger in stereotypes is not that they are only true, that they're untrue, but that they make the only story the story for all. And we dive into her talk, we have an analysis of it, a discussion of it, and it helps the students to really see differently how other people might understand things in a way that is very different 
from their own. We look into scholarly articles, this one written by um, Afuatum Donsoimo, and she looks at the multiplicities of African childhoods. And although this paper covers really what's going on in Ghana, it relates a lot to my students' experiences even in Senegal, noticing that many of them are not poor African children. Even though that is true that there are, it is not necessarily their truth. So finding ways to incorporate some of those skills um, that they need to learn. Inspired by the Ubuntu philosophy, I am because we are, we go from the individual to the collective. We look at youth movements in understanding visuals and being able to analyze them. This is one of the notable pictures from the Soweto uprisings um, with the unfortunate death of Peter, um, uh, um, Hector Peterson. And this opens up uh, students' ability to look at youth movements around the world and so they do their own presentations. Some of them choose to do it on Black Lives Matter as a youth movement or a movement started by young people. Um, Yonama, which is a local movement in Senegal, or Power Shift, which relates to environmental movements. In our second unit, we look at social and economic um, elements to communities, and we look at what makes a community sustainable, but what also makes a community unsustainable. And at this moment in time, we travel to a place not too far from here, somewhere in DC. Um, this is one of the topics that we open up with, is gentrification and their understanding of how inequalities can be systemic and how they can touch up on different elements of race and class and even gender. So this really inspiring documentary um, that's called There Goes a Neighborhood by um, Al Jazeera is one of our opening conversations about issues in the United States that many of my students have lived. We talk about race and this really interesting piece from the New York Times is a conversation on race that opens up this dialogue not only in a black versus white dichotomy, but really to multiple people's experience about race in the United States and what that means. One of our argument analysis pieces is a piece on comedy and how that can be used to um, bring up uncomfortable conversations. And so my students really like this piece and I just wanted to share it up there. And it helps us to understand the biases that we have um, as an extra credit assignment, I have my students take the Harvard Implicit Association Test, and they realize that they themselves carry some of the biases that they accuse others of carrying, and it brings about interesting um, ways of understanding not only racial bias, but also gender bias. Um, so we also have conversations about African feminism, which isn't talked about often enough in many spaces. Um, this blogger, Mina Salami, shares several articles about African feminism, and we also bring in the words of Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, and Kimberlé Crenshaw when we're talking about intersectionality. So really tying it back to our identity and how it relates um, to what they're learning. I love this picture because Mina Salami picked it up when we shared it on social media. So I use the class also as a means to engage the students through technology. And they were quite excited about going viral at the time. Um, and also connecting them to the world outside of the classroom. So this is one of the field trips that we did to the Women's Museum in Dakar about AWA, which is the first African feminist magazine in Francophone West Africa. So it was really, like you could see the magic in their eyes making the connection between what we were learning and what they were experiencing in their everyday lives. Looking at inequalities, so we talked about race and gender and now class, um, there are inequalities that my students see and live on a daily basis, whether it's through the news or whether it's even at home in their neighborhoods. And so we talk about that. Understanding economic inequality, how, is, how are economies growing in Africa, although there is a growing amount of poverty. Um, also understanding where they fit into the picture in terms of a middle class and also issues around urbanization. And this empathy piece, which is an exercise, I get the students to write a rap or a poem related to what, it would, what would life be like if they were to be born poor or if they were to be born extremely wealthy. And so bringing in the culture, the hip hop, this is the most fun class time because they really get to express themselves creativi creatively. And um, the summative assessment for our unit two is inspired by Afrofuturism, which really gives them the creative green light to imagine what Dakar, which is the city that we live in, 
um, could look like in the year 2030, um, whether it's a desired, undesired future, something in transition, or a total wild card. And with this, we really work on the collaborative skills because it's a group project, and I get them to make a film about it. So they have to write, they have to research, and they have to create, really um, going beyond. And what it would look like, so I've talked about all these topics and themes, but at the end of the day, it still looks like your classroom. So we have students presenting their projects. Um, we have students engage in Socratic seminar discussion, talking about the pieces, students doing their argument analysis or writing their essays, and finding connections between what they've learned and who they are. Thank you. So Rugi gave us uh, this beautifully amazing story of a, an environmental perspective that you could take the seminar and kind of an overview. I'm gonna look at the kind of pragmatic side of what would this look like in the classroom, what does this look like day to day, especially for new teachers that are trying to figure out how do I incorporate this content. This kind of gives you a little bit more framework for that. So uh, number one strategy I use each year is first off, build relevance, because this is gonna get buy-in from your students. So as I mentioned before, I have a really ethnically diverse um, student body. So if I just present it from, okay, we're gonna do African diaspora, I might lose some of them just right in that minute. Like, oh, I don't care about that. Or I know, they were slaves, like who cares? Why? So you gotta build that relevance, build that buy-in. There's a couple different ways I can do that. Um, so one is I'm coming from a historical background from psychology, so I trace the historical lineage of current events that are happening right now. So I introduce them to current events that they might already be familiar with in, um, in our area. Police brutality is the big thing that comes up, so if we ever talk about racial discrimination, all the hands are up, I'm like, yeah, police brutality. And then when I ask for number two, the hands go down. And they're like, oh, I don't, is there still other racism? Like, is that, isn't that it? I'm like, no, no, let's talk about systemic racism. So I bring up race, racial inequality in the medical field, um, even in medical school. There's um, a New York Times, or not New York Times, but Yale produced a survey that showed that 75% of students going into the medical field hold a racial bias, uh, that African Americans have a, har a larger pain tolerance, as a result they're not prescribed pain medication as frequently. Um, there was other research demonstrating that African American babies in their first three days are not visited by nurses the same amount as Caucasian babies, even in their first three days. So it's starting from, from day one, and so a lot of kids don't know about that information. I demonstrate to them things like environmental racism, the higher rates of asthma in African-American children compared to their Caucasian and Latina counterpoints. We look at racial disparities, not only in our own school, but also um, nationally. It helps for them when they see it at our own school as well, because we are a school that prides itself on tolerance and diversity and inclusivity, but we see it happening right in our own backyards that our, even though our African-American male students make up 6% of our population, they're making up the majority of kids that are getting suspended and expelled in our school here. So when they, kids start to see this, they're like, oh my gosh, Miss Nolte, we gotta do something. I'm like, right, you're in the right place, here we go. We're gonna do something about these problems. So letting them see what it looks like in their own world and then tracing kind of historically, how did we get to it here in 2023? And then ultimately, how do we fix it? That's the whole goal of this. Um, another way to build relevance is, you know, kids are on TikTok, they're on their cell phones. 17 hours out of the 24 hour day when they're not sleeping. So I use that as a tool instead of trying to combat it and be like, well, don't use it. I'm gonna, you know, trick them into using their cell phones for learning basically. Mm -hmm. So um, if you guys are familiar, for example, with the Bechdel test, um, it was originally created um, to measure gender inequality in movies and in cinema. There's also one for racial inequalities. So one of the first assignments to give them early in the year is pick whatever movie they want. It can be their favorite movie, just anything, like just watch a movie for, for three hours, that's your homework, and then give it the Bechdel test. The Bechdel test asks students, uh, number one, is there a minority character? Number two, does that character have a name? And number three, do two minority characters talk to each other about something that is not a Caucasian character, basically? Well, um, over the last five years when we've done this, it's usually about 80% of movies do not pass the Bechdel test. They usually don't get past the first one, which is do they have a named minority character. Mm -hmm. So again, students start to see like, oh my God, I had no idea this movie was like that. It's my favorite movie, that's crazy. 
Um, also, I always tell the kids, like, I'm going to ruin your lives. I'm going to ruin your childhood. That's kind of the phrase I use because, like, we put Disney tests to the Bechdel test. It doesn't go well for Disney movies. Like, none of them. None of them make it. And I love Disney, so that's, that's the bummer. Um, we look at different media as well, like even something as simple as like this Nivea ad here, um, the different news coverage that media does for um, calling an African American criminal versus calling a Caucasian a university student, even though the same crime allegedly has been committed. So again, just, and these aren't handpicked, it's just we look through magazines and like let's try and find stuff that looks a little sketchy to us. So just again, expose them in their real life of what's around them. Um, the second thing, that helps, so after you build the relevance, after you kind of build the importance of like why this matters, why we should focus on cultural studies in African diaspora, I now focus on um, kind of like the more fun aspects of seminar. Um, as you guys know, seminar is, uh, is heavy on writing and on presentations and not a lot of 15 and 16 year olds love that aspect, so I try to give them, again, kind of tricking them into their presentation skills, so we do a lot of uh, what I call like a dinner party. So like in our cultural unit, they all choose a character that they want to present, basically. So it can range anything in this particular one from JFK to Claudette Colvin, Bayard Rustin, and they dress up like that person. They, if they know how to do the accent, they do the accent like that person, and we, have, they, we bring in food, and we have like a little dinner party conference. Um, in this case, it was answering the question of how do we convince Southerners to end Jim Crow, and we actually have that like meeting as if we were in the 1950s um, trying to take care of this. And the kids love it for one because they get to, you know, they get to be someone else for a day. They get to be MLK for a day or Soakley Carmichael. And it's really good for invoking multiple lenses and teaching kids broader aspects of history. So in um, California, in the US, you know, civil rights is covered, not necessarily in depth. And they're able to see like, oh my gosh, Stokely Carmichael actually was in direct opposition to MLK, and MLK actually had a lot of similar ideas to Malcolm X, and I would have never thought that because the traditional narrative is that they were you know, rivals, and that's not necessarily the case. So they're able to see different perspectives even on the same topic. Um, along those lines of engaging students, and then this is a good way to kind of branch out to, um, but still incorporating African diaspora, is we use a lot of debates, a lot of discussions, again, kind of encouraging them to practice their public speaking skills, but in a, a low pressure environment that they don't feel like on stage or anything like that. They're just in a room talking with their cohort, with their friends. Um, I try to do a debate at least once a week in the first semester before we get to the performance task, because then again, by the time they are actually presenting, they feel comfortable in that public speaking role. So some two sample questions I put up here is, um, Again, the traditional narrative about President Lincoln is he's the emancipator. He's the great president that freed all the slaves and made everything good for African Americans. And we look at two sources. Um, I provide them with the sources, and we work on contextual cues and analyzing primary sources. And they then choose a side of, well, did he really promote social equality, or was it for a different motive, or did he not actually promote it at all? So again, they can choose their sides. Um, another one is, um, during and after COVID, we saw a strong spike in anti-Asian hate crimes. But even with that, we still saw the um, hate crimes towards uh, black Americans is still the highest ranking. So again, tying both concepts together. And um, again, they can choose their sides. One of the approaches to solving this issue was using anti-racism classes. And would that be an effective strategy to help mitigate racism, to help ameliorate uh, inequality? So we had that debate. Um, and I want it to be noted too that particularly in my class for debates, it's not like a debate class. So the goal is not to convince other people and just get on your soapbox and say, this is what I think and you're wrong. The goal of our debate that I communicate to the kids is to listen to the other perspectives, take in what they're saying. And at some point I remind them that you should switch sides at some point in the debate. So if you started over here, you heard an interesting argument, go switch sides for a while if you end up staying on that side. But the goal is not to just convince people this is what I think and you're wrong. It's let me hear what you have to say about it. Oh, I never thought of it that way. This can also be brought in out to kind of just any social issue, again, connecting that to the African diaspora content. So I let them choose whatever social issue they feel is most pertinent in our society right now. There's been everything ranging from fast fashion to mass incarceration, just anything in between. And so we just kind of break down those steps of what is the current issue, how did we get here? What should things look like? 
and then it starts them working in collaborative groups, which is something they need for performance tasks. Again, works on their public speaking because they do a presentation on this, and it starts to work them on their research skills as well. So it's kind of tying in the seminar skills that may be new for kids that, like for our school, AP seminar is kind of like the intro AP class. Most of the kids have not taken an AP class before this, so it's kind of like scaffolding in it and embedding the skills, but in a fun manner that they won't feel overwhelmed with as their first AP class. So getting in more to the writing aspect of AP seminar, once they kind of have these basic research skills intact, we've worked on public speaking, we've worked on um, collaboration and groups, I usually will give them to kind of mimic their performance task uh, two, with College Board, I'll give them some sources, some stimulus centered on a general theme. So like in this case, I used, um, if you guys are familiar with Michelle Alexander and her, her book, New Jim Crow, as well as 13th, the documentary on Netflix, I used her information. Um, I used Jonathan Kozal's Savage Inequalities, so I take just excerpts around the same theme of like inequality or Jim Crow or whatever that theme is that I've chosen. And then they can then create their own research question, they conduct their own research on the topic, and then they end up writing a, what starts off as a scaffolded paper, they might just do the introduction, and then one body and so forth. But it gives them, again, kind of like practice on a, on a smaller level so they're not getting that 2,000 page paper um, and feeling overwhelmed with it all at once. Um, again, building the writing skills. I do try and front load some information. So I think it was Philadelphia on the panel that said African American history is a, is a mandatory. That's amazing. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that. Um, so they, they come in knowing who MLK is, sort of. And that Rosa Parks sat on a bus, and that's, that's kind of it. So I do have to scaffold a bit of the content um, and inch front load it, I mean. Um, so one of the areas we focus on is historical characters the Brute, the Tom, the Mammy, things like that. We show how that impacts today, like the Aunt Jemima brand that's existed for the last 100 plus years. Uh, the one on the bottom is the, usually that gets the most concern is you have LeBron James posing like the 19th century brute um, from actually the Spanish-American War and the, the kids lose their mind when they, they're like, not LeBron, why would, but if it's LeBron, I'm like, yeah, yeah, so racial equality is everywhere, guys. Um, so they're able to see that and then we connect it again. I just give them the sources they create their research question and then they start to find new sources with this one now as well. They write the paper with it and so again, it's building all of the seminar skills into this one with topics that they're gonna be interested in and that is eye-opening for them as well. Um, so I know for me as a new teacher, one of the number one things I'm looking for is just, this is all great, but tell me where to find it. Like, where do I get this stuff? These have been some of the most helpful resources I've found. Obviously, EBSCO, which College Board gives you access to. If your school happens to write a ProQuest account, ProQuest is also really helpful as um, a scholarly journal search engine. Um, Google Scholar is okay if you can find PDFs. I tell the students that as well. There's some good free PDFs out there. With these particular websites, as far as civil rights issues go, issues related to African Americans, getting the perspective of African American writers, those are all good go-tos. Um, I also use a lot of just textbooks and take out excerpts from them. Uh, to get sources as well. So these particular authors, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Lerone Bennett, um, I use The Miseducation of the Negro from the 30s by Carter G. Woodson. So it's likely that any books that you're already reading, if you read a passage that you're like, oh man, that's interesting, like just take that passage, use that, you know, throw that into and make, make an assignment out of it. That's kind of how I based a lot of it on. Um, some of the things that when I first started, so like I said, this is year six, my first year going into this, is um, I actually, I kind of stumbled onto the capstone program. We had, I was teaching African American history at our school uh, about four years before that. And then due to political climate, we weren't allowed to have that class anymore. And so my, my district kind of told me like, hey, if you can find an AP class to do this, we can do it. So I was like, ooh, seminar, you can make up your own stuff. I found an AP class, like, let me do it. So I came into seminar teaching African American history, like that was all I taught. And I found that because I have students that are African American, but I also had a lot of Asian American, Latino American, as I said, there was a, a pretty solid chunk of kids that were like, that was really cool that I learned about Byron Rustin, but like, what about my story? Like, what about my people? 
So my number one advice would be um, expand, like expand the focus. You can still use African diaspora and connect it to Asian American, connect it to the Chicano movement, connect it to feminist movements of the 70s. Like there's ways to make those branches so that way every kid feels like their story is being told and we're not focusing just on one group. Um, the other thing kind of as I mentioned before is, again, it, might, it depends on your school and your political climate in your area, but definitely don't assume prior knowledge. Again, I came in like dropping names that they, Joan Robinson, they're like, I, I don't know who that is. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, Ella Baker, they're like, I don't, I don't know who. Uh, Rosa Parks? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what do you guys know about Rosa Parks? Uh, was that, was that the girl with the, 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 I was, she like, I'm like a bus, you guys, a bus. Oh, yeah, 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 she sat on the bus, right? She was tired, she was tired that day. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so uh, I had a little, you know, had to take myself back a little bit and figure out, you know, the, what I thought they knew, they didn't quite know. So front-loading content, I know we wanna try and avoid lectures as much as possible but do some front loading so that way they're gonna be better writers and more interested in the material because they'll know about it as well. There's a lot of reasons why using African diaspora was um, so rewarding, but um, one of the big ones was the aha moments, like the LeBron that we saw earlier, uh, when students learned about Frederick Douglass, when they learned about Jim Crow, um, one of the things that I show them is what's happening in Corona locally. So we look at, we talked a bit about earlier, like food deserts, and we see in Corona that we have some of those pockets in our own neighborhood. We see that in Corona, we have our school, and then a mile away, there's a predominantly Caucasian school that somehow gets significantly more funding than our school does a mile and a half away. And so they're able to see things like that. In California, our funding's based on property taxes. I don't know if it's different in other states. But to see what it looks like in their own hometown, you get a lot of like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was going on. Uh, the knowledge sharing I'm probably most proud of because I'll have kids, and again, anytime a teenager gets excited about anything that you taught them, you're like, oh, that's a win. Um, I'll have kids come in and be like, Miss no, I told my friend about Frederick Douglass, they didn't even know who he was. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. I have moms emailing me like, tell me more about Bayard Rustin, like, what was he like? I'm like, oh, okay, like, join the class, come sit in. Like, and so that's really inspiring as well. Students then become inspired to do their own research. So outside of my assignments, outside of the stuff I'm talking about, they're like, oh, let me look into this other thing that is unprompted. So again, anytime you can get a teenager, spark that curiosity is really exciting. And then uh, maybe the biggest one is because of how the debates are structured, because they are getting exposed to kind of uh, sometimes controversial topics, topics that make them think outside of their original selves, they often end up leaving the class more open-minded. They came in with a certain point of view, with a certain lens, and now after hearing 40 other kids tell them their stories, they're like, oh man, I never saw it that way. And they're hosting their own debates with their friends. I'm like, you guys are the coolest high schoolers I know, like keep that up. So that's really been inspiring and incorporating this content. And for me, some of the things that have been most rewarding, I think I shared about the joy that really just transcends through their eyes when we're learning certain things. And I think it's the element of representation. In so many of the classes that they have to take, they're subject-based classes where they're learning content about things that they might or might not be interested in or that they might or might not find relevant to their current day or in the future. But in this African diaspora-inspired class and seminar, they're really able to not only find their voice, but then to be able to use it. And one of the most rewarding things out is what happens outside of our AP classroom room even. I had students who were recruited um, to do a study with UNICEF as youth researchers because of those skills that they were building in seminar and the confidence that they had to be able to carry out a project. Um, I also had a student who won an award as part of a data insights, looking at their data analysis skills and tied with their creativity. Um, and so those are some of the examples that I like to share. Um, but also on the next slide, there is, um, during the 2020 events, we had to continue our school year virtually. And the conversations that we had had prior, uh, prior to those events about youth movements and Black Lives Matter, students had really seen themselves in those, is those issues. And after the death of George Floyd, um, they took on their own creative project. As you see here, they created their own visuals and they shared on their social media platforms to engage 
their own peers in discussions about what was going on in the world. And even though we were in Senegal, they felt so connected to things that were happening in the US. And I think so many parts of the world were really able to live out those connections. And so it's not always what's happening in the classroom, but how I've seen my students really shine and become agents of themselves. And that was really the inspiration that I had when I thought, what type of class would I have wanted to be in? What type of class do I think my students want? How can I combine what I'm passionate about and how I want them to go out into the world and make that change? And seminar with African diaspora really created that unique environment for me to be able to do so. So as we conclude, <laughs> um, both, of, uh, both Jasmine and I really thought that the concluding points in terms of centering and engaging students in cultural studies um, or using African diaspora is really incorporating our own passions as teachers and using that to transmit it and help students to discover their own passions. Um, with that, there is a lot of flexibility from meeting the needs of the students that you have in front of you to adapting to COVID times. Um, so much can change and flexibility is one of those key skills and then also, the sky is the limit. There is perhaps no perfect way of going about this. There's no one way of going about this. So be creative, be open to what's happening in and around um, you and use that as an opportunity to create transformational change. Oh, so I don't know if we have much time, but if we do have a little bit of time, um, there was a handout that I created as a result of this presentation and thinking about how do I get new teachers to this inclusion of African diaspora or even new to seminar, thinking about how to center their students for the design of their units or of their class. So this handout is also on Athena. I added my handout, I added it in there yesterday, so I'm really happy about that. You can find it there, along with several other resources that teachers are creating, some who are in this room also. Um, and it's really just a long list of elements to think about. Creating an avatar. I borrowed this idea from business, like what is your ideal client? Not thinking about your ideal student, but thinking about what is the demographic of your class and who is going to be in there. So not just their age and their race or their orientation, um, but what are some of the historical events that are gonna be important to them? What are the ongoing current events? What are those conversations that are happening? Um, in relation to place, where do they live? Where do they hang out? Um, what is the type of music that they listen to or the food? Really outlining exactly who is it that I'm going to be teaching and who is it that I'm gonna be facilitating a learning space with and that as the center for creating everything else. So if the handout is helpful for you, let me know. I'd love to exchange more about it. Thank you. So if you have questions, we're happy to answer. Um, so I do everything kind of small chunks, right? So they don't actually write the full 2000 paper until second semester, but up to that point, we've done the intro. And then the next part, we'll do a body. The next part, we'll do the conclusion paragraph. So by the end, we put all those pieces together. Um, I do a lot of group work to save on grading because that's a lot of papers, individual papers to grade. Uh, we do a lot of group presentations for timing purposes. We just don't have the time for every kid to do a six minute presentation. So things like that to kind of chunk the material quite a bit and save your grading quite a bit as well. I can add to that a lot of peer reviewing and peer assessment. I think getting students to look over each other's work is one of the most empowering ways to get them not only to see what they could do better in their own, but also give that feedback to their students. I think that also helps. Yes, 
That's a great question. So um, yes, yeah, so in addition to the larger assessments, the papers, things like that, I also started incorporating a weekly reflection. So that way the students are, and so far they've been actually um, brutally honest about themselves and their contribution in the class. And the reflection just asks them, how much are you contributing? It doesn't ask them about their knowledge level, because that's not the point. It's asking how much do you contribute to the class? What's your engagement in the class? Things like that. So that way when parents do come and ask, why does my kid have this grade? I show them the reflection, like your kid gave themselves that grade. Like that's, that, and I, I tell them I have the liberty to increase or lower their score. I never have to lower their score. But um, that's been something that you can put in the grade book for points as well on a weekly basis and helps justify their grade that they end up with to parents that are concerned or worried. I do a lot of completion-based assessments. So them doing it gets them the full mark. Um, and one is to really get students away from being so grade focused, like is this gonna get me an A? Is this gonna get me an A? Is this gonna be on a test? And more, did you do it? And them doing it just carries them, it takes them so much farther into the content and exploration. So completion based, if you did it, you get the point. If you didn't, well, you didn't do it. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Marushi. Thank you for the presentation. Can you share some of the feedback you're receiving from your alumni who are in AP seminar? Um, the questions include, are, are they pursuing this, these topics at, at, as they continue? Um, are, are the skills transferring to other classes? Uh, interested in your alumni feedback. Thank you. Yeah, so far it's been really, really, really good, really positive feedback. I have students coming in that are going into research methods or research design courses after you know AP research or senior year. And they're like, oh my God, Ms. Nall, I already know how to do it. Like the rest of the class had no idea how to write a paper and I already turned mine in and it's great and I'm getting high scores on it. I've had a student that um, the research he conducted, he was focusing on internal motivation in sports and what leads to burnout in athletes. And he actually carried that research into his freshman year at um, Oregon State. He ended up getting a, a paid internship to help conduct that research. So, and that's more AP research, less seminar. Uh, but it, we're seeing the results happening as they go into college and they are coming back saying, I have the skills in my English class, in my research methods class, that the other kids don't have these same skills. So we're getting positive feedback so far. I think I share the same. Um, a lot of my students, I get them in both seminar and in research. And in research, they're allowed to choose whatever topics they want. And a lot of them choose to go deeper into some of the topics that we covered in seminar because they found that as something that they could connect with. Um, I really, um, I really also am pleased to know that one of my students who graduated even from college last year, she's now looking into a graduate program in sustainable development. So it really was like, oh wow, we talked about this in high school. She went all through college and now is looking for it um, in graduate studies. And I've also had students who um, have created a nonprofit organization to give back and help in Senegal. These are college students who are now in the US, but that seminar course where we looked at what is the role of young Africans in changing those narratives, but also being agents of change, and they reach out to me, they're like, we need help with this, what can you do? And it's because of that experience that we had in seminar. So for me, really, it's like, what are they doing outside of the classroom? And there are many more success or positive, positive returns that I get from it. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is, you had mentioned that the, it's the first AP course, this AP seminar is the first course that they've taken. My question for you is, do they come into that class, into that course, already having the skills necessary? Or then if not, then how do you scaffold those skills, given that you have such large numbers? And it's related to the question that Rushi was saying in terms of those students having developed those skills. What is that timeline in terms of the development of the skills, given the heavy writing that needs to be that they need to be able to demonstrate success within the course. Yeah, so the first part of that, um, they, they have no skills when they come in. <laughs> Unfortunately, it would be awesome if they did. Um, so a lot of scaffolding is done, I would say by the first three weeks, we start in early August, so by the end of August, they've already written a portion of a paper. Um, and that's done, again, on piece by piece. Like we, we sentence frame, we break down sentences at a time. I'm teaching them what evidence is, I'm teaching them what analysis is. Um, so that's embedded with the dinner parties and the debates. So that's kind of like how the scheduling goes, like we'll do a debate and then we'll learn what evidence is. We'll do a discussion and then we'll talk about what bias is in writing, things like that. So 
as far as pacing goes. I would say by uh, November, they've written each part of an essay, not the whole thing together yet, but they've done the intro, they've done a counter. Uh, we've learned how to analyze a credible source versus a non-credible source. Um, like Rugi mentioned, there is a lot of peer review. I use that a little bit more in the second semester. Um, but we go through the rubric too, and I allow them, once I've graded it, I give a lot of feedback on the initial grading, which is a bit time consuming uh, to begin with. But it does help them because they're able to see like, oh, okay, I missed this point for this exact reason, like because the rubric is so clear. And I'm trying to think, by, yeah, so by December when we're ending our first semester, um, as I mentioned, we don't, they are not coming in having written a full entire thing, but they have done chunks. So that way when we do the performance task, I'm like, hey guys, we're just putting the chunks together and it's the same thing that you've already done. So I would say like August to October is a little bit more teacher intensive on the grading, yeah. but then November, December things start to slow down because the kids understand what's expected of them. So I would do a lot of focus on rubric and um, so the kids understand what the rubric is. I try to rewrite it in more student-friendly terms so they understand what exactly they're being graded on and that I tell them the phrases like, we don't need fluff in seminar. Like in AP Lang and AP Lit, there's a lot of like, ooh, entice the reader. Like I don't need to, they're getting paid to read your paper, guys. Like I've been there in the summer, they're gonna read it. We don't need all that. So teaching them the straight, kind of straightforward, like just this, this, and this. If you're writing something outside of it, don't because you're cutting into your word count. Um, I get students who have a francophone background, and so this is their first AP class. Um, they are still in the learning of English, but what I really appreciate about AP seminar is that it's so focused on the skills that it forgives some of the lack of totally correct English, if I may express myself in that way. So it's really about what are the skills that these students are learning, how are they applying it, um, through the different performance tasks and even at the end of the year and less of a perfect written essay, if that may, if that, if I may say it in that way. Um, so there's perhaps more opportunity for students to do well in seminar than we might think. All right, thank you, thank you.